Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to be talking through how I made this extended rocket set here. So these are the higher level rockets in the game. This is the time lapse of me making them and painting them and I'll be commentating over the top telling you how I went about it and the techniques that I used. Do check out the playlists in the description and on my channel for more techniques in detail about how I go about doing these things, particularly the texture painting one. So first of all, as this is the kind of advanced set, I've brought in the rocket from the old set, just so I can get an idea of the shape, size, and the colors as well when I start painting a bit later on. Now, all these techniques are very straightforward, really. They're just basic modeling techniques using cylinders and cubes. You can see me here using the auto mirror tool, so I'm mirroring it in the X and Y axis. That cuts down a lot on the workload in terms of the painting. I can paint just one corner. Obviously, I can build just one corner as well, but when it comes to the painting and the UVs, we're trying to save space as much as we can because these are on quite small texture sizes. As I've talked about before, those texture sizes can be very constraining and limiting, especially when it comes to things like shading. You can't really shade very well if it's mirrored across from one side to another because you see the repetitions and you can't add too much detail. It's been very handy actually playing the game and seeing the models in game so I can get a good idea of the size of the objects so I know how much detail to put into the textures. And that was very interesting and revealing, really. I probably put a little bit more detail in than I needed on occasions, but I suppose it's better to go that way than have to add detail later. But that is something you always need to consider when you're modeling for games, is the actual resolution and size you're going to see the object at, therefore how much detail you need to put into. And that's both in the modeling and the texturing. The modeling stage is very simplistic, as you can see here, just very basic objects. Most of the detail comes out in the painting. I've talked about it before as well, but these are all modular assets, so all these shapes are being repeated across lots of these different models. So you have to be careful when you, let's say, paint some detail onto one section, if it's going to be hidden later on or overlap something later on or detract some from something else later on. So you have to sort of think ahead quite a lot and it does take a bit of getting used to. So all the time when I'm copying an object, I'm using an instance, so Alt-D rather than Shift-D in Blender. So those instances will mean that whenever I change the shape in one of them, it will change and update in all of them. And that's really good because if you need to make a minor change, you can easily do that to all those objects uh, because it's an instance. The only problem you might come up against if you're using Blender for that is that you can't apply your modifiers to an instant object, so you have to sort of separate it, then reapply it, and it can get a bit confusing and tricky. But again, those are the sort of things that you get used to over time. I've really enjoyed playing the game. I think it is quite a fun game, especially the fact that you have to go out and collect things, and it does make a big difference if you go out and go scavenging. It's made me go on lots of <laughs> bike rides and lots of extra dog walks, which has been quite fun. I do like to take lots of breaks during the day, so it's a good idea to get outside, get some fresh air, get some vitamin D. <laughs> and I found the game is actually encouraging me to do that, just to go out and scavenge and uh, get some resources ready for my armies and so forth to attack people's bases. Do let me know in the comments below how you're getting on with the game, if you've downloaded it and if you're playing it. And of course what your thoughts are and how you're getting on. So in this section I changed my view and my rendering to cavity and that can be quite handy to see the edges and extremities and the cavities. So using those Metcap options which are in the viewport shading can be really useful, especially when you've got sort of low poly objects like this and it's hard to sort of see and distinguish between them. Occasionally I do go over to the rendered mode so I can see the rendering of the rockets and what the color is going to look like and so forth just to make sure everything's working often get asked about the overlapping and that's absolutely fine to have overlapping objects. You try and cut it down to a minimum so it's not overlapping too much, you're not wasting any vertices or anything like that. The overlap itself doesn't really cost you anything but extra faces that aren't seen, that's really pointless, so you don't really want that. A lot of the time when I'm modeling, I'm modeling and rotating and so forth around the 3D cursor so I place my cursor somewhere and then use that to influence how the shape is evolving. It's hard to describe that but uh, using the 3D cursor as your center point or pivot point I should say uh, for especially when you're doing things that are circular or cylindrical so you can copy them and just do one quarter and then like I say copy it around to the other quarter. 
It's been really fun to see the animations that have been added to this project as well, or these models. And you can see me here, I'm making sort of uh, pistons on the side, and I've got to keep those separate so they can be separate objects. Um, that's something you need to think about when you're exporting. Obviously, you, it's difficult to go from straight from Blender into a game engine, um, so you need to export it. Uh, I'm exporting as Wavefront OBJ, uh, so they all need to be sort of separate objects and then joined together uh, in the game engine. So any of those animatable objects, uh, they need to be separated. The techniques I use are fairly basic and it's mainly sort of box modeling, but occasionally I do sort of plane modeling where I'll build something up with a plane and then I'll solidify it. I also often just duplicate an object and use that as my starting point. So there I used one of the sort of circular bits going around and then I'm distorting it into a crystal shape. Crystals are quite fun really, you can be really random, but it's actually quite awkward to get the shape looking like a crystal at times. So I do have lots of reference images. It's really important to do that. Well, I find it's really important for me anyway. It can save time as well if you sort of anchor your thoughts about what a crystal looks like and it stops you kind of going off on one thinking a crystal looks a certain way and you start modeling it and then you realize that it just doesn't look right. So have some reference images there. I think that's quite important whenever you're working really. So on that weird sort of spiky thing, you can see that I've started with a plane and built it up. I think that's quite useful sort of for sort of flat surface type things, if that makes any sense. So I'm onto the painting now, uh, obviously using the colors from the initial set and then advancing them. The idea is that they get sort of more metallic and uh, crystal and gold as we go up the level. So uh, there's a bit of gold introduced and then there's a bit of crystal introduced. Uh, and that's the thinking anyway, so sort of gold and then magical crystals. But I'm always trying to keep the color theme so it was a sort of red and blue starting point with the rocket set, so I've continued that as we go along. What you can see me doing here as well is I'm blocking in the colors and making sure they work together first before going into the detail. I don't always do that, but I thought it was a good idea in this case. I'm quite happy with how these things are working out, so I'm kind of missing that step out a little bit as I go on with these sets. Now what you can see me doing here, the red bits are where you uh, are seeing the back of an object and in a game engine, generally speaking, you won't see the back side of things. That's called sort of back face culling. So you have to make sure that objects have some sort of solidity, uh, that they're not just a single face. Otherwise you will just see through them when you go around to the other side. So once I've made sure all the faces have turned the right way and I've given them some solidity, and that's, sometimes that's quite simple. I just literally copy the face and pull it across and flip it so it's got another side to it. Uh, now I'm going into the detail section and doing the painting. This is the really fun bit. I absolutely love doing this, uh, sort of painting the little details, uh, the shininess texture of the metals. I'm making them more shiny as we go along. They were very sort of rough metals in the earlier levels, uh, as if it's sort of worn, but now they're getting more and more shiny <laughs> with these sort of mini highlights. It's quite hard to get metals looking shiny. I found the uh, color dodge is the best way to do that with a slightly different color, especially with metallics, this is, uh, to give it that uh, shine. Uh, because met metal colors, uh, they come through in the reflections. It's quite unusual uh, compared to dielectrics, um, dielectric materials. So those are non-metallics. Uh, so <laughs> you, you use the color dodge with uh, metals to give them that sort of shiny glow. It's, uh, it's a new technique that I hadn't seen before and I'm quite impressed with how that's working out. So you can see here, I'm about to go to the color dodge for the very edge. At the moment, I'm using the screen for the edge and then the color dodge. You can see that color coming out. It, it just works. It just it makes it look metallic. So I'm quite pleased about that technique. I wish I'd uh, learned it earlier, actually. Um, but uh, you've got to experiment. You've got to try these things out and you uh, develop techniques as you're going along. Some of these minor elements, uh, you see sort of dents and dinks, they're probably a bit pointless, but I do like to put them in still. They don't take too long, and if someone zooms right in, it just adds that tiny bit of character, so um, I do like to uh, put them in occasionally. It's much harder, though, when you're doing modular assets because those textures are repeated, and you don't obviously want to see repetition across your shapes, uh, especially when it comes to those character elements because then it looks really obviously repeated. Um, so they're to a minimum, and I only put them in places where uh, they're on the edge of a corner so you can't see them next to each other. You have to sort of zoom around your object and then you'll see it. 
So things like these tiny rivets, they're quite fun to put in and small character elements. And again, uh, they're not easily seen, but it does help to uh, sell them as uh, metal objects. So uh, it's, it's good to put them in, I think, anyway, even if you're mostly zoomed out and you're only going to see them in a minor way. But it, I think it, it makes a difference. I always find those spikes quite tough, getting the uh, the shine of them working. Because painted on shine and reflection doesn't ever really work. Uh, it's just giving the illusion, because obviously when you move about, the reflection should move as well. And it obviously doesn't in this case when it's painted on. Uh, so you kind of have to blur things and uh, distort them. So it just sort of gives the illusion of a reflection. And you can see the gold elements going in now. And I like to give a little bit of red in the gold. Uh, so it goes, uh, it's a tiny bit brassy in a way, uh, but uh, it's that sort of color, the red being used with the color dodge is how it gets that sort of slight tint of color. And I, quite, I find that it just works for me. I, well, I, I think it works anyway. Uh, and that's what I've been doing uh, with the gold materials to make them look more goldy. And also with those gold materials, I did want to give them a little bit more sort of shine and uh, extravagance. So I did make them uh, more shiny uh, for that reason. So I used a lot of color dodge. Occasionally you come across a weird glitch like I was there uh, where I had a face on top of a face uh, and it looked like I wasn't able to paint and it took me a few moments to figure out what was going on there. And you will come across those problems when you're texture painting uh, and it's usually something like uh, having doubles reverse normals, uh, those sort of classic problems. Uh, so I, I, I even suffer from them myself uh, on occasions. Lots of people ask whether I should be using Substance Painter to paint with instead of uh, Blender. I like to do it all in Blender. Uh, I think for the moment a Substance Painter isn't quite there in terms of uh, low poly texturing. Uh, certainly if you've got high poly sculpts that you want to put across into a low poly texture uh, then Substance Painter will work but uh, you, there's no substitution for actually hand painting these things unfortunately at the moment uh, well fortunately for me anyway uh, but uh, you can't really get that hand painted look on low poly objects uh, with all those sort of cavity maps and uh, those type of things you actually have to paint them on. I do get asked in terms of what sort of tools um, are better than Blender um, uh, there's things like Marmoset and uh, other programs they probably are a bit better than blender with the texture painting but i'm quite used to blender and it is often just what you're used to uh, that you will end up keep using the texture painting in blender i think has a long way to go really i think that's one of the things that has been a little bit left behind uh, there's been some great advancements with sculpting and obviously ev and so forth but the texture painting elements are they're, they're lacking a bit i would say uh, and they can be a touch glitchy and frustrating to use at times. So I can appreciate why other people would say there's other programs that are better, but I'm kind of used to those glitches so I know what's going on with them and I find it, it works for me. It took me a while to get the actual sort of crystal type rocket working uh, and this will probably have lots of uh, animations and visual effect things in Unity going with it that uh, Chris is going to add. And those have been really good fun to see. When you actually see the animations, they really bring the, the models to life. Uh, so they look very sort of static here and uh, a little bit dull. Uh, but adding that tiny bit of animation makes a huge amount of difference with a few of those sort of visual effects swirls and glows and uh, lights bouncing things and stuff. Uh, they look really good and I'm really uh, pleased that, that those elements are being added to the models because it, yeah, it really sells them. So obviously the rockets are kind of advancing as well. You can see that there was a sort of basic rocket to start off with and then that rocket got built up uh, and then it became four rockets and then it became a crystal rocket. It's quite, I do like those sort of uh, mini advancements in the levels. It's, it's quite fun to uh, <laughs> slowly build up. Uh, and build up these really extravagant things at the end uh, with all the gold and the crystals and so forth. The great thing about the instance is it does speed up your workflow so you paint one and it just updates on all of them because they are sharing UVs and that's uh, something that's quite complicated for beginners to understand but uh, you, you are uh, painting on one and it updates on all of them because they have overlapping UVs as it's called so they're sharing the same texture space. <laughs> uh, lots of tutorials on my playlist about UVs and uh, 
uh, texture painting and um, all sorts where I go into detail for from a beginner's perspective. So if you want to know more about that, then please do have a look at those. Some people have been asking me about the um, concept art. At the moment, there's not very detailed concept art. Um, so it's just the models because Chris is quite fairly confident about uh, my sort of ideas when it comes to colors and we've worked together a fair bit now so I've got a good idea of where he wants to go so he's just sort of uh, given me the ideas of how he wants the models to progress um, and they're sort of very basic um, non-rendered um, but it gives me enough detail and information to go by and then I add the colors in based on the previous sets um, and obviously he gave, gave me some ideas about adding gold and crystals and so forth and uh, sometimes color schemes will say can we have this uh, for this one, uh, this set. Um, so obviously there's some communication there but generally speaking uh, Chris is fairly happy to leave me to my own devices with these things uh, and sort of build them up uh, and it's been going really well. I've got to say as well that working for Cerberus International on this game Atlas Empires has been really a great experience. They've been fantastic and really supportive of my work, really encouraging uh, and that's a, a nice place to be. It makes a huge difference when you're working with people that are supportive and encouraging. So if you are scouting around for work for different companies, different game companies, do have a look at the people you'll be working with because it, it really is a massive influence in your work. So uh, you'll want to be working with people that you can get along with, uh, which is I'm very lucky with, with Atlas Empires. So there we have it, the rocket set, or the advanced rocket set, I should say. And you can see a tiny bit of animation going on there. I uh, just thought I'd add that in to show the rough idea of what will be happening eventually when you download them in the Atlas Empires game. Hope you're enjoying this series. Well done if you've made it this far. Most people <laughs> probably don't watch to the end with these things. Uh, so uh, let me know how you're getting on with these sort of commentaries and whether you want me to add anything or do anything differently, or if you have any questions. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.